Thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here and uh, quite a tough act to follow. And um, although I will say I am also married, but not on the same level or the same degree and, and journey that he had. We had a very conventional one in New Orleans. And I'm here to give you something completely different. Uh, I'm not going to take you on a personal journey. I'm going to take you on a journey to the fantastic uh, about what we can do with science and technology to probably get without some of the limits that we've uh, commonly ascribed to manufacturing and life on planet Earth. Um, and just in full disclosure, I grew up on a simple cow town, uh, Blair, Nebraska. Um, I, uh, I have a love-hate relationship with agriculture, to say the least. And I, I love Nebraska so much, I joined the Navy right out of high school to uh, <laughs> celebrate it. So um, I'm going to give you, you know, that kind of flavor throughout all of it. But um, hopefully at the end of this, I, can, I want to leave you with a couple of things. Um, and one of them is that we live in an era of just wonders. And the question is not really what can we do, but what should we do with them? And what are the biggest and most pressing issues that we can solve using the technologies that we have at hand and our disposal and our control today? And that's really uh, a once in a lifetime type of experience to go through and seeing it from my perspective, it's really one of my core motivations for getting up every day. The major issues of our time, I mean, uh, they are plentiful. We live in interesting times, right? We've got challenges in food, water, energy, environment, and health. You've heard a lot of talks already today about some of those challenges. And the other point is that they're all interconnected. <clears throat> and that as we try to solve one problem and one barrier that's over here, it sometimes unlocks problems in another completely seemingly unrelated but in intimately linked field. Um, and so if you're trying to really come up with a solution set for these, you have to take a system of systems approach and really understand the fundamentals that are underlying all these problems that are manifesting themselves in various different myriad ways. And then you have the added pleasure of dealing with politics and policy that can sometimes confound uh, the best of intentions and uh, not saying that I've experienced anything like it, but um, we live in interesting times. <clears throat> population explosion, right? One of our biggest challenges. By 2050, the global population is expected to reach close to 10 billion people, right? And you think about the available acreage that is available for uh, humanity to support itself. Uh, the fact that we also have the, the confounding factor of climate change and some of the other uh, limitations on our natural resources, it, it really gives you pause to wonder how are we going to maintain the quality of life in the developed world and support the growing quality of life in the developing world so that we eliminate a lot of the scarcity resource and inequities that are kind of seemingly hardwired into planet Earth, at least in the human side of it. And so that, that is a really big challenge that we need to be aware of and, and hit head on. And hopefully science and technology, in addition to just the common decency of humanity, can, can solve some of these issues in a very substantive way. Now, again, with that population explosion, we're also going to have energy demand, right? Even though in the developed world, like in the EU and the United States, uh, per capita energy consumption is going down thanks to some energy innovations around energy efficiency, renewable energy, and others. But still, the energy demand is expected to increase worldwide by about 60% in the next 30 years. And where is that energy going to come from? A lot of my friends believe that, um, and colleagues believe in a silver bullet solution, that we can come up with one technology, be it solar, be it hydrogen, be it windmills, whatever, to really meet that, that need. I'm more of a silver shotgun guy. I believe that we need a lot of shots on goal and we need a lot of technologies that are fault tolerant and robust enough so that they can be deployed and scaled in a regional setting and, and really take advantage of the natural resources to help meet that energy demand increase. And then on top of it all, if we don't answer the bell on those issues and we still have this energy increase in demand, it will produce an increase in carbon dioxide emissions and greenhouse gas emissions that are related to it. And, I, and in the furor of the past few weeks, um, both domestic and national and international affairs, you may have missed some very important news that just came out this week. Uh, one of them from uh, uh, the WMO, uh, it, World uh, Meteorology uh, Organization, announced that we've reached the highest CO2 levels in 2016 in the past 800,000 years. Congratulations. We've done a great job in that regard. And that was at the end of the last ice age, okay? In addition, there was a federal report that came out from 13 federal agencies that was issued to the president that saying that um, the greenhouse gas emissions and global warming, uh, the impact is already being felt. 
um, and that it's you know, very likely that it's, uh, the humanity has a major role to play in greenhouse gas emissions and global warming. Uh, in fact, they stated that there is no other countervailing theory that would that hold or pass muster in that regard. And that unless we take drastic action, at the end of this century, sea levels could rise up to eight feet. Okay? And that fires and drought will become commonplace. And that the world, uh, arable land, to grow and supply the 9.6 billion people will be severely constrained. And so you can see this gathering storm of factors that are coming on. And this is not something that is far off, right? The impacts that we're talking about will be felt within our lifetimes that may already be being felt right now today. And so the question is, what are the best ways that we can address that? And, and what can we do to really answer the science and technology challenges so that we can really make a difference where it counts and really take this huge carbon sink that is now up in the atmosphere and put it somewhere on planet Earth where we can use it for a common benefit? And that's really the challenge that I'm going to be talking about for the remainder of the talk. Carbon is the backbone of the US economy, right? Not surprisingly. Uh, we are made of carbon. Uh, carbon is the most plentiful, abundant uh, uh, element on planet Earth. And we derive a lot from it, right? It is, it is ubiquitous in our everyday lives. Everything we see and touch has some way to do with carbon. We have advanced polymers that, that uh, benefit our life. They go all the way from building and insulating materials, uh, all the way to polycarbonate windows that are now going to be developed as photovoltaic materials. Uh, we have advanced materials. The wonder of carbon fiber uh, is, is rather remarkable. It is now being used for infrastructure repair and highways. Uh, what used to be just a, an oddity that would be constrained to a laboratory environment is now also every day in our lives. If you fly on a 787, uh, the Dreamliner from Boeing, that is a carbon composite material as the backbone of the entire fuselage of that plane. Uh, and it's also enabling the light weighting and fuel efficiency gains that are rather remarkable compared to aluminum, the other standard material. And then we have one th example here that I just have to point out, the Apple Theater uh, the carbon roof, where they actually assembled the whole thing from a pre-preg carbon fiber and then brought it over on a crane and just dropped it in place on top of a building. It's amazing, amazing science and engineering. And then we have chemicals and fuels, obviously. Um, those are primarily carbon. And then we have uh, all the chemicals that we use today that are also derived from carbon. So that the, the carbon-based economy is huge and expanding. And it's going nowhere but up given the population demand and also the increasing in the energy demand as well. So they're all interlinked. And the current, com current carbon economy um, is relegated to photosynthesis. It's really underpinned by photosynthesis no matter which way you tease it out. Photosynthesis created all the vegetative matter and the, and the dinosaurs that ate that vegetative matter that went into the fossil fuels that we uh, consume today, as that represented by that lower pile of uh, seemingly black dirt and the natural gas systems there. Um, and then you also have photosynthesis that can derive in plants that we can also harvest into uh, fuels and chemicals. But these feedstocks are all derived from photosynthesis. Okay? And photosynthesis is why we are here. And so you have these feedstocks that are available for conversion, and that's exactly what we do. Being in a conventional refinery uh, that takes the, the fossil fuels, be it petroleum or coal, and cracks it and converts it into meeting all the demands that are in those markets. You can do the same thing with a biorefinery, right? Which the goal here is to take the carbon that's in the atmosphere, fixate it into plants, convert those plants into sugars and those sugars into fuels that we can then consume, and try and close out that carbon balance a little bit, or at least make a big dent in it. Um, and then you, also have, you can also burn this biomass for power and generate a lot of things there. And what's important to note is that the U.S. is on track to have the cheapest and most available energy and carbon dioxide in the world. Right? Everybody thinks China's cheaper, better, faster. No. The United States, with the integration of the renewable sector and others, are on track to have this in great plentiful supply that is very affordable and cheap for a lot of different conversion technologies. So the question is then, well, gosh, what can we do with that? Well, what one project that I'm working on, we call it the, the big carbon idea, is we want to take the CO2 and combine it with the cheap, abundant energy that is there and capture that CO2 directly, be it from emissions from a power plant or from the atmosphere. In the, and I'll get into a little bit about how we're doing that a little bit later on. And then you take that carbon and then put it through different conversion pathways so that you can go into new and existing products and then also augment the carbon economy that's here today. And so think about it. Could we live in a, on a planet 
where the CO2 that is such a problem in the atmosphere and is being emitted by coal-fired power plants that are being built one a day in China, what if we could take those emissions and turn them something from a negative thing into a directly beneficial and positive economic one? How can we decriminalize carbon dioxide? Basically the goal here. And then you can get around all these pestering social uh, and political arguments about whether who's causing what, when, where, how, and why, and it's just too big for solving. Now we could actually take that carbon dioxide and convert it directly into things that we use today and do so affordably and scalably over the next three decades. That's the goal that we're working on. And so the, the way that we're doing this is we're, we're doing reactive capture where we're taking a look at photosynthesis and how cells, plants, and microbes are actually able to transport CO2 selectively into the space that they need it to be and mimic that and put it into these massive frameworks that we could actually deploy and like uh, pass through flow reactors to scrub CO2 from whatever source of emissions we wanted to. And then take those, uh, once we have the CO2 isolated, we can then rewire biology to then basically put photosynthesis on steroids and go from CO2 into these building blocks that we can then build up into high molecular weight polymers, into fuels, into anything we want at will. That's the power of the genomics era. We can also combine biology with catalysis, and these are the great catalysts that are embedded in uh, metal organic frameworks to really enhance the kinetics of biology. Biology is really great at being specific and really good at being precise, but it's not really great at being really, really fast. Chemical catalysis is very, very good at being very, very fast. And so if we can combine these, we think we can get over that activation barrier um, hump to come up with the ways that we can develop all those products and all these advances that I have listed over here on your right um, that really make the transformation jump from where we are today into the economy of tomorrow. Now, we have to rewire biology to make that happen. I pointed that out. And biological engineering is slow. Even though the, the, the biological engineering is pretty much state-of-the-art and responsible for pharmaceuticals, antibiotics, a lot of antivirals, antimalarial drugs, and others, it's still really slow and not anywhere near where we are in other conventional modes of uh, manufacturing. If you think of a silicon uh, semiconductor fab that is responsible for the integrated circuit and all the supercomputers that you're all having in your pockets right now called iPhones or smartphones, um, we have standardized the manufacturing of silicon in that environment that now you can have any researcher in the world basically come up with a circuit design, send it off to a foundry, and have it made on demand. We want to do the same thing with biology in this design, build, test, learn loop, which is basically the engineering approach to scientific methodology, right? You design something, then you build it, you test to see if it does what it does, if it fails, you try to learn from it, and then you do it again in this iterative cycle. Well, we want to come up with the advanced biological foundry, where we have a lot of these different targets that could be anything that we've talked about today, be it a, a compound, a pathway, a, catal a catalyst, and we go through predictive biology tools, these software tools where we can design circuits in biology on demand, transform them into cells and plants on demand using robotics, and then test them out in these high throughput analytics, and then use machine learning and AI based on these massive data sets to predict the next transformation and the next turn of the crank that we need to attain in order to make this process more efficient. And then you need to integrate them all together in a cohesive whole and make sure that the target is achieved in a way that is affordable, scalable, sustainable, and meets all the primary metrics that you want. Right? Simple enough. So uh, hopefully, you know, <laughs> You know, in about five or 10 years, I'll come back and it'll be like, yeah, meh. simple, we did it. So the goals we have is that by 2030, we want to strengthen the US bioeconomy, and it's the global marketplace. Let's just be honest with ourselves. And we really want to develop these technologies that can directly convert carbon dioxide into polymers, materials, energy, and chemicals, develop the tools that allow us to be predictive in the engineering space, um, shorten the development time so we don't have to spend so much time iterating on this, and really come up with a data analysis to, to the public that inspires confidence in what we're doing. And I just want to leave you with this world without limits because a lot of the inequities and a lot of the warfare and a lot of the angst that we suffer through is really about resource distribution and inequality. And what if, just imagine, anywhere in the world you could go and build one of these systems and convert the CO2 in the atmosphere into things that drive the local economy. That, I think, would be a world without limits. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>